as the attendees and panelists, I thank you for uh, joining me and this afternoon. Uh, welcome to this, this webinar uh, titled Pillar 2 Model Rules for Domestic Implementation of the 15% Global Minimum Tax. The audio is not so good that at some point eh, the, the voice fades in and out somewhere. My apologies, I'll be loud enough. And I, I, will, I, I will try to go a bit slow. Pillar two model rules for domestic implementation of the 15% global minimum tax. And what it means for transmission in East Africa for multinational enterprises. So this is just a brief introduction of what we're talking about today. So on July 10th, 2021, the G20 endorsed the key components of the two tax reform that was recently endorsed by 132 countries and the victims. Constituting the vast majority of the G20 and the OECD countries, inclusive framework on the base, base erosion and profit shifting. Pillar 2 consists of two rules intended for introduction into the national uh, domestic tax laws and treaty based rules. The two domestic tax rules, <clears throat> the income inclusion rule and its backstop, the under tax payment rule, are together known as the global anti based erosion rule. The pillar model rules provide governments with a precise template for taking forward two pillar solutions, the two pillar solutions to address the tax challenges arising from the digitalization and globalization of the economy agreed by countries and jurisdictions under the G20 inclusive framework of the BEPS. The GLOBE rules provide for a coordinated system of taxation intended to ensure large MNEs pay this minimum level of tax on income arising in each of the jurisdictions in which they operate. The rules create a top of tax, in quotes, to be applied on profit in any jurisdiction whenever the effective tax rate determined on a jurisdictional basis is below the minimum of 15%. So having said that, uh, I will introduce my co-moderator, Mr. Obeli, to introduce the panelists and open up the floor for the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Hello, My name is Billy uh, Obeki. Um, I'm a district and tax lawyer based in Nairobi. Um, I have the pleasure of co moderating this uh, this afternoon session with together with my work. I'd briefly like to introduce our, our two speakers today. Um, so our first speaker will be Dr. Leila Latin, who is a, a tax expert, um, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, Commissioner for Oaths and Notary Public. Um, she is also a, a law lecturer, and uh, Mokua and I have had the pleasure of uh, having gone through her hands uh, as a law lecturer at university. She is also the proprietor of. Um, Laila Latif and Company, um, a, a law firm based in, in, in Kenya and the wider East Africa. So I uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Laila Latif, for making time to be with us uh, this afternoon. Um, our second speaker, who will uh, shortly join us after Dr. Laila Latif, has, uh, has had a chance to speak to us, is um, Diodone. Um, Diodone is um, a partner at, uh, is a tax partner at ENS Rwanda. Um, he is um, a, a, an, an experienced uh, tax and commercial practitioner in Rwanda who primarily uh, advises on um, corporate and commercial law, uh, mergers and acquisitions, and various transactional tax matters. Um, so we, we we are pleased to also have Dudone as well with us to, to to join us in the discussion together with Dr. Lena Latif on the Pillar Two Global Minimum Tax Model and its implications on 
Eastern Africa multinational enterprises and the ESC economies. Hello, Eddie. Eddie, can you hear me? Hello, Sepas. I can hear you. Yeah, so uh, is are we waiting for Leila or for the other? Um, apologies. Uh, we are waiting for Dr. Leila to join us. Yeah. Hello, can Dr. Leila, are you able to, to, to join us? You could uh, kindly give us a minute or two um, to have Dr. Laila join us. Sorry about that. Um, can you hear me clearly now? Can I start? Yes, this is much better. Thank you. You can comment. All right. Thank you so much. I'm very sorry. Um, I'm, I'm in a Swatini at the moment where the internet is not really the best, but we will make do with what we can. Um, just a minute, I just share my slides. Okay, um, fantastic. So Asante Sana for having this um, discussion going forward. I hope everyone's day has been going very well. And thank you to everybody for joining in. Um, <clears throat> so when we speak of BEPS, the acronym for base erosion and profit shifting, it refers to tax planning strategies that exploit gaps and mismatches in tax rules to artificially shift profits to low or no tax locations where there is little or no economic activity. Now, this usually undermines the fairness and integrity of tax systems because businesses that operate across borders can use BEPS to gain a competitive advantage over enterprises that operate at a domestic level. So to curb BEPS practices, we had the OECD BEPS project that has developed a number of rules, standards and instruments for countries to collectively implement, such as the country by country reporting, the automatic exchange of information, beneficial ownership transparency, and what we're discussing today, which is the two pillars, pillar one, <coughs> and pillar two. So when it comes to pillar one, pillar one proposes a partial reallocation of taxation rights. Pillar two, which we you know refer to as globe rules, introduces a minimum effective taxation for large multinational groups. The objective of pillar two is to guarantee a minimum level of taxation by introducing rules that grant jurisdictions additional taxing rights as well as to limit tax competition between jurisdictions. So um, as, a result of, as a result of all this uh, discussions around BAPS, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, um, a minimum tax rate of 15% has been agreed to. Right, but before I discuss the um, Pillar 2 rules, I want to flag out some concerns that I personally have and concerns may not be shared by other colleagues as well. So there was basically a report that was published by Tax Justice Network that discussed the beneficiaries of Pillar 2 tax proposals. And the report indicated that the G7 countries, the, the rich countries, right, um, which are home to 10% of the world's population, will get 60% 
of the new tax revenue generated under pillar two, while low income countries where the African continent is based will take 3%. That should hit home. And then we had Oxford Economics. They also conducted a study on the pillars and they found that low middle income countries would actually lose $230 million based on the application of pillar two. That's a concern, right? The other concern is that um, pillar two proposes a minimum tax of 15%. The corporate income tax rate of many low middle income countries is higher than this. And these countries rely on corporate income tax, uh, tax rates income tax, corporate income tax. So the new baseline of 15% is actually concerning. It's forcing countries to raise to the rate. 15%. The average of African countries for income tax, 20.5%. fiscal space. Burundi are members of the inclusive inclusive apps by the OECD and members to allow industries to work putting OECD members in Naira, we have lost you. I, 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 I guess uh, she, her account has dropped. Eh? And, uh, Instead of on time, that not the Daniel and Mr. Obergi, we agree. Probably uh, we can start, we can uh, proceed with Mr. Dibane, do his presentation as uh, after he comes back. Yeah, I agree. If the Dibane is ready, we can, stay, we can, he can chip in until uh, Leila's uh, internet is fixed. Cool. Yeah, we need to and then there are internet challenges in that country. And therefore, let's indulge her. Okay, let, 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 me, let me share my screen. Sorry, um, I'm back. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 there's nothing I can do. I mean, the internet here is really shit. I'm sorry, crap. Sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know where I, where did you? Probably I'll just go straight to the, the issues here. Um, Okay. We, we lost you at, at the concern slide. At the concern slide? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, where is it? Okay. So, basically, what we're seeing, right, is that it's not pillar two is not going to work for our continent, much particular the East Africa region. The reason being that pillar two is proposing a 15% minimum tax. But when you look at the Tax Justice Network, it produced a study that said the G7 countries, which are home to 10% of the world population, will take about 60% of the new tax revenue generated out of P2 proposals, Pillar 2. And low-income countries will only take home 3%. That's significant disparity. Then we also had a study from Oxford Economics, and they said if you implement Pillar 2 proposals, low middle-income countries will lose 230 million. Okay? Now, Look at the, gr the global average corporate tax rate in the world. It stands at 24%. The average corporate income tax rate for African countries stands at 27.5%. So when we're implementing Pillar 2 at 15%, it's really not commensurate with the socioeconomic realities on um, the continent itself and the global average. The other problem is that we already have Tanzania, Uganda, Burundi, and Rwanda who are not members 
of the inclusive framework. Now, the inclusive framework is where the G20 and the OECD member states came together to open up the, the OECD platform for the rest of the world to join in in their discussion around how do we curb illicit financial flows and how do we, you know, plug the loopholes that lead to base erosion. Now, only Kenya is a member of the inclusive framework insofar as the East Africa region is concerned. This is going to pose problems when it comes to the implementation of Pillar 2 in itself. So let's just now turn on to Pillar 2 itself. Um, what does it mean for implementation? What does it mean for multinational um, enterprises? So Pillar 2 imposes a 15% minimum tax on the earnings of multinational enterprises who will have a minimum turnover of uh, 750 million euros and more. This means that about 8,000 enterprises worldwide will be subject to this tax. Now the question is, how is this 15% minimum tax going to be imposed? This here, what you see are the five steps that would, you know, would help us to unpack this discussion going further. So I'll probably start with the first step. Now, the first step is to identify the constituent entities of the group that are subject to Pillar 2 and their role in respect of this minimum taxation. So we have the um, ultimate parent entity, we have partially owned parent entities, we've got intermediate parent entities, minority owned parent entities, permanent establishments, transparent companies, as well as joint ventures that are going to form part of number one, which are the constituent entities to which Pillar 2 will start its application on. Now, for example, I think it's always good to give examples because examples help us understand better. Um, let's say there's a multinational group. Um, no, I'm going to give the example for the second part, right? So we already have the constituent entities and then subsequently now on number two, the qualifying income or loss is to be determined for each constituent entity based on the year end result in accordance with the consolidated accounting standard. Okay. What its income or loss is. So think of an example. Um, this group consisting of an parent entity has two parent entities: parent entity one, parent entity two. Has its financial statements in accordance with the consolidated accounting standard the OECD. The qualifying income or loss of each entity will then be determined based on their year-end financial results. That's how we calculate the second part. And then thirdly, we move on to the covered taxes of each constituent entity, which need to be calculated to estimate what the Pillar 2 proposal is going to From the example we have, the um, uh, own entity one has been in its operation and partially owned parent entity paid five million in taxes. These amounts are going to be considered for the we're looking for multinational at multinational enterprise or not that we Enterprise as an independent and so it's going to be covered going forward. Um, then we move on to the fourth part. Each constituent has reported on its income has imported on its uh, losses. We've established each jurisdiction's um, internet tax, income tax rate or corporate tax rate that applies to each of these entities. Now we've got to establish the effective tax rate. So how do we calculate the effective tax rate under pillar two? So the, 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 the calculation of the effective tax rate per jurisdiction would be to divide the sum of the adjusted covered taxes of all constituent entities by the sum 
of the qualifying income of all constituent entities per jurisdiction. Already, this is complex in terms of understanding. So in terms of an example, is that suppose the sum of the adjusted covered taxes for the first entity, which was um, for the first entity, which was 10 million, and then the second entity, which was 5 million, the total becoming 15 million. Now the sum of their qualifying income, say is 100 million in a particular jurisdiction, then the effective tax rate for that jurisdiction would be 15%, right? So what we're doing is that we're taking 15 million divided by 100 million, which would make up the effective tax rate that the country would be able to tax. And then the ETR is compared with the minimum tax rate under pillar two. So if in Tanzania, one entity paid tax at 13%, and in Burundi, the same entity subsidiary paid tax at 16%, if you're going to apply pillar two, it means in Burundi where it paid 13%, it's below the pillar two threshold, which means Burundi is entitled to demand from the multinational corporation a top up tax of 2% so that it reaches the minimum threshold proposed at by the OECD under the pillar two. So this means that countries cannot be able to reduce their corporate income tax, even if the domestic legislation of that country requires a reduced tax rate. So if Burundi says you're paying 13%, but pillar two says you're paying 15%, eventually the extra 2% will have to be paid by the parent entity, depending on the rules, or it will, be, it will have to be paid by the constituent entity itself going forward. So I know that discussing these particular steps can be a bit complicated to understand it. And therefore, I think it's really important to be able to look at it in terms of what really um, Pillar 2 is proposing in terms of calculating the 15% going forward, especially where countries like in Ireland, the tax rate is 13%. But Pillar 2 says, you know, 15%. Um, which country gets entitled to pick up on that 2%. So we've got different rules. We've got the income inclusion rule. We've got the um, undertaxed payment rule, the qualified domestic minimum top up tax and the subject to tax rule. These are basically the thresholds or the three methods proposed under pillar two to ensure that the minimum tax rate of 15% is actually collected. And all these three methods are to prevent tax avoidance and to ensure all income is captured for taxation and subjected to the 15% tax rate. Now, the question is, how do these methods actually work? So I think um, let's look at it in terms of an example. The income inclusion rule itself is designed to counteract the erosion of the space by identifying and in been subjected to tax at or above the minimum tax rate in any jurisdiction. This income um, inclusion rule ensures that income subject to low taxation or the companies in Kenya. So say sorry Dr. Leta, we've we've lost you for a bit. Are you able to hear us? I think we'll we'll just give her a minute or two to see if she'll be able to join us again.
Any way can be a day uh, that. And we have. Okay. Yeah. Let, let, let me share my screen. Second. Are you able to see my screen? I hope so. Yes, we can see it. Can see yeah. it. Okay, yes, no, Wonder can... wonderful. I think uh, mine will cover the, the implication of pillar two global minimum tax to East African community economies. But as Latif had not completed, you know, the discussion of these laws introduced under, under pillar two. So I think I can quite quickly talk about the income inclusion rule qualified domestic minimum tax and under tax, tax payment rules, as well as subject to tax laws before maybe I dive into the, 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 the implications of the pillar two global rules to, 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 to ESC econ economies. Now, as, 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 as Latif had, had explained, so in 2021, in October, 2021, when the G7 countries adopted, you know, pillar two, the, the two pillar solution, and in this specific case, pillar two. So the point was that all multinational companies, which are within the scope of, 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 of pillar two, and those are multinationals with annual turnover of 750 euro, must be taxed at a global minimum tax rate of 15%. So, and the implication of that is if let's say a company like Microsoft has subsidiary in Rwanda, and that subsidiary is paying, uh, is subject to effective tax rates of 10%. So then the top up tax of 5% should be paid in the in the country of ultimate parent entity. So now that's why over the last two years, the OECD has been working on the model laws for implementing uh, the global minimum tax of, of, of 15%. So the global laws, uh, which were, uh, you know, it is by the OECD has four rules. The first rule is income inclusion. And this rule allows the the ultimate, the ultimate parent, the country of ultimate parent company, to 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 to, to apply a top up tax on the on, on where the one of the constituent entities of the MA, of the multinational enterprise is subject to ETR or effective tax rate below fifteen percent. Then the key MTT or qualified domestic minimum tax minimum top up tax allows the source state that's basically the, the state where the other constituent entity that is liable to, to to effective rate i mean to effective tax rate of that is below 15 percent to to, to 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 apply a top-up tax as a way of basically you know preventing the country of the ultimate parent company to apply the the the, the top-up tax now the utpr and the tax and, and the tax profit rule this applies where none of the source country, that's basically the country where the constituent entity is based, and the country of the ultimate parent entity adopts uh, pillar two, or basically applies the minimum tax rate. So in that case, the third jurisdictions in which that MNE has operations will have the right, you know, to apply top up tax, you know. That's why this loan is referred to as under, uh, under tax under tax profit loan. Then there is STR subject to tax loan. Subject to, to tax loan mainly concerns passive income, mainly interest and loyalties, and it applies where, for instance, the, the DTA between two countries and the tax rate under that DTA is below nine percent, and the payments made to the person to, to a given person are subject to to a tax rate that is below nine percent in the country of resident. So in in the country of residence. So in that case, the the, 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 the other partner state, the, the other treaty contracting state, would, which is the source country, would have the right to charge 
a top up tax, which you know up to nine percent, you know, as per, 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 per the global rules. Of course, unlike other rules under global rules, which can be implemented without requiring amendment of the existing double tax treaties. So the subject to tax rule will would necessitate the amendment of the of the existing DTAs for it to be to be applied. Otherwise, you know, it, it cannot be possible for the source state to charge a top up tax based on the fact that you know the the the, the, the I mean the, the the payments made in terms of priorities or interest are not taxed at least at the rate of 9% in the country of residence. So I think that's quite quickly what I can talk about uh, these uh, rules under, 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 under pillar, pillar two. So then I will, I will, I will, I will go ahead with, with the, my presentation discussing the, the effect or the implications of pillar two global minimum tax on the ESC economy. So now to begin with, most of ESC countries rely on tax incentives uh, as a way of attracting foreign direct investment so, for instance, here in Rwanda, the, the investment code provides for tax holidays, preferential CIT rates. So, and for obvious reasons, because most of the developing economies do not have, you know, sufficient infrastructure and, you know, other things to take, you know, to attract investment. So that's why they have resorted to tax incentives as a way of attracting fund direct investments. So, these, incent these incentives may be statutory or provided for under investment promotion laws, or they may be negotiated. So now, pillar two, it does not consider standard CIT rates generally applicable in the source country. So basically, if let's say a country has a CIT rate of 30%, that's not what pillar two considers. It actually considers the tax rate effectively applicable on a given constituent entity. So that's why, you know, unlike some of the tax treaty agreements, which uh, some tax treaties which have what we call uh, tax sparing provisions, where you know for the purpose of granting uh, tax credits, so the entity in you know deriving income in the source state would be deemed to have paid the taxes that would have been paid had not such taxes been reduced by you know, in accordance with investment promotion laws. So as Latif indicated, uh, effective tax rate is calculated by, by you know, dividing uh, adjusted cover taxes by grub income of you know, the, the, the constituent entity in a specific jurisdiction. But of course, under uh, Groby laws, uh, OECD recognized the need for you know, the developing economies to use incentives as a way of attracting fund direct investment. And that's why it introduced what we call SBIE or substance based income exclusion exception so in this specific case part of when determining you know the 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 the, 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 the income amount to be subject to top up tax in the country of the ultimate parent entity where the constituent entity is subject to an ETR that is below 15 percent so that amount must be reduced by you know uh, this uh, I mean, by 80% of calling the value of tangible assets held by the constituent entity in the source country and 10% of payroll cost. But of course, this is during the transition period of 10 years. But after 10 years, you know, these, these you know, uh, exclusion or carve out will be limited at, at 5%. Then how that, then what are the implications of, 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 pillar, of, of pillar two global rules on the ESC economies? So. Pillar two global rules affect ESC economies, whether they are members or if not or, or of the inclusive framework or not, and whether they adopt global minimum tax or not. And as Latif indicated, we only have Kenya in the South African community, which has joined the inclusive framework. And it's clear most of the ESC economies are unlikely to, you know, to, to adopt the, 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 this pillar two, because you know, they are mainly capital importing countries and you know only countries that are capital exporting which have their business from national enterprises of swelling their profits in low tax jurisdiction would be interested in, 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 in pillar two. But in all cases, whether they adopt them or not, they are going to be affected. Now, in terms of implication, Groby rules lend as effective tax incentives offered by, by ESC economies to in scope MNEs constituent entities operating in ESC countries. Maybe to give an example, let's say, in Rwanda, the, the standard CIT rate is 30%. But you may find an investor who has, depending on the importance of the project they're implementing in Rwanda, who, have, who has 
negotiated a CIT, a CIT holiday for seven years. So that means that the entire income, you know, Rwanda has uh, forfeited its right to tax is going to be taxed in another jurisdiction in terms of income inclusion law or under tax profit under tax profit laws. So that's the main, uh, you know, challenge that arises from these global rules as far as ESC countries are concerned, because the purpose of granting incentives, which is basically to attract FDIs, FDIs is not going to work simply because the income, I mean, the tax, you know, the taxing right, the ESC economies will, will have forfeited or waived are going to be exercised by, uh, by other countries. Now, what should then ESC countries do to deal with, you know, these uh, challenges that, is, that these challenges that are that emanate from the, the implementation of pillar two global minimum tax. So as, 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 as I've just indicated, so it's clear that Rwanda, Kenya, Uganda, Burundi, or Tanzania would not wish to forfeit its taxing light in favor of a big economy like the US. And that's what would happen if nothing is done. So the first thing that needs to be done by the, the ESC economies, each need to identify in scope multinational enterprises you know constituting constituting entities constituent entities operating in their respective jurisdictions which are subject to the ETR that is below 15% and with income of more or less equal or more than euro million euro 1 million or which is equal or more than you know 10, uh, 10 million in, in, in revenue because you know the the global laws provides for a de minimis exception where constituent entities whose income is below 1 million euro or 10 million euro in revenue are not you know uh, captured by the the, the, the global law so and in terms of you know how this exercise or assessment would be undertaken so i think the 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 country by country reports filed with the tax administra administration for transfer pricing purposes can be very useful for undertaking this assessment. And once this identification is complete, then the next step should be to identify the ultimate parent entity of, the, of a given mass national enterprise, which has constituent entities in one of the ESC jurisdiction. And the purpose of this is to make sure that the country of the ultimate parent entity adopted PIRA 1 and is applying, you know, uh, is charging the top up tax in terms of the income inclusion law. And now, depending on the findings of, of one of, of either of the East countries after this assessment, that's how then they would decide which action to be taken to respond to pillar 2 implication on the economy. So four options are available for ESC economy. The first one is to adopt the qualified domestic minimum top-up tax. The second one is to adopt the generalized domestic minimum tax. The third one is to review its incentives. And the fourth is to focus on other priorities. So to begin with the, the, the qualified domestic minimum top-up tax. So this can be adopted by a country where they believe that you know, they don't have so many in-scope MNEs constituent entities. But you know they have a considerable number of you know constituent entities whose income may be eventually taxed in other jurisdictions. Jurisdictions should they fail, you know, to 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 to, to, to apply a domestic top up tax. And the way Kid MTT works, so if let's say a company has a, a tax holiday of 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 seven years, and the income of that company is going to be taxed in the country of the ultimate parent entity, the source country would say, look. Even if we don't tax you, your income is going to be taxed at a, at a, at a fifteen percent, you know, in terms of income inclusion loan. So, and then that country, what what that, that country would do would be to apply a top up tax of fifteen percent on the income of that, you know, constituent entity in the source country. And this would vary depending on the ETR, the effective tax rate to which that constituent entity is subjected to. So, if let's say the constituent entity in the source country is subject to an ETR of 3%, that would mean that the quid MTT in that specific case would be 13%. But while the country finds that there are a lot of in-scope 
MNE constituent entities, they may decide to adopt a generalized domestic minimum tax, which would be applying across the board. But this would only be relevant if you really think that you have a lot of constituent entities that are, that are members, you know, of the in scope MNEs. And to remind what I've just to recall what I've to, I mean to re, to recall what I've just said. So the in scope entities are those MNEs which have a global annual annual turnover of Euro 750 million. Now, the third option is to review incentives. So with the killer two lending, you know, most of the incentives granted in developing economies ineffective because, you know, the income that is not taxed in the source countries is going to be taxed in the, the country of the ultimate parent entity. So some of the, you know, the incentives availed by developing economies may become ineffective. So, and that's why those countries may need to go back and look into the, uh, the incentive regime and see if some of the incentives may not even be repealed instead of, you know, for fate, I mean, of letting the income source from the, the, their jurisdictions being taxed by, by foreign economies. Now, the fourth alternative, which would really apply where after the assessment, the source country found that only a very few in scope MNEs constituent entity entities and in their jurisdiction, or if there are some, few or none are likely to have local effective tax rate that is below 15%. So, and I think this is why most of the, Af I mean, African countries may fall because you may find that some of the African countries who don't have like two or three MNEs operating in, a, in their jurisdiction that are within the scope of, of, of PIRA 2. But of course, where they find that there's a considerable number of in scope MNEs, that's why the first uh, two options would be considered mainly the QDMTT and generalized domestic minimum tax. But even in the last case, where the country think that they should focus on other priorities because they don't have, you know, a number of in scope MNEs just firing the introduction of qualified domestic minimum tax, top, top minimum top up tax, and the likes. So they would still make sure that they keep monitoring local and global development because with time, some of the entities may eventually fall under pillar two scope, or maybe with the discussion at a global level, the, 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 the applicable threshold for in scope, you know, for a given MNE to fall under the pillar two scope may be reduced. So I think that's why it is very important, even if the country may, may at this point decide not to do anything to respond to pillar two, they need to keep monitoring what is going on globally and, and locally. And again, with all these uh, options available to developing economies as a way of responding to pillar two, come with challenges. And that's what I'm going to discuss at my last slide. So. The potential legal challenges associated with all these options available to developing, to developing countries, uh, as far as responding to pillar two is concerned, are mainly related to the stabilization clauses in investment agreement between social states and investors and bilateral investment treaties. Uh, as you may be aware, most of these multinational, when the multinational enterprise, when they invest in developing economies, say in energy project, mining and the likes, they would enter into uh, concession agreements, power purchase agreement, or other kind of agreements with host government. And under those agreements, they would include, include clauses stabilizing, you know, tax, ta the, the applicable taxes at the time of, you know, of, of them deploying their investment. And any change in taxes in the future during the lifetime of the project would not apply to their project. And if they are to apply, then the government would have to compensate them. So now, if then, the government would say that now, given that the pillar two has come, and if we don't tax you, your income is going to be taxed in the country of ultimate parent entity. So, and we are introducing a qualified domestic minimum top up tax. This may be an issue. Some of the investors may say that this is a breach of the of the investment agreement. And as a result of this, then we would expect to see a lot of arbitrations around this bit before the the exceed and the other and the other institutions of, of arbitration. But in all cases, I, 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 I tend to think that uh, MNEs should be cooperative with host countries because in all cases, they would, they, would, they would not be worse off as a result of source country domestic measures to prevent the exercise of their taxing rights by other countries via income inclusion group 
and the UTP out top up tax would be paid in the UPE country via income inclusion rule or third countries via under tax profits anyway. So maybe to, 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 to add more on this, even if uh, the MNU well was to commence arbitration, yes, the arbitrary tribunal may say that there have been a breach of the investment agreement, but in terms of damages, so it will be difficult for the MNUs to establish that there have been any loss because in all cases, even if that income was not to be taxed in the source state by way of uh, qualified domestic minimum ta minimum top up tax. Still, the MNE would be subject to, to tax to, to top up tax in the country of the, the ultimate parent entity. Or if the ultimate parent entity country does not adopt pillar two, then in you know third countries under under tax profit laws. So I think that's what uh, I can say in terms of. Uh, the implication of pillar two global minimum tax on uh, ESC economies. Thank you. Thank you, Dude. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the very, very short but articulate presentation. Maybe as we wait for Madam Leda, there's something you talked about um, on the East African uh, uh, community countries, uh, maybe losing out or being unable to implement this global tax, global minimum tax. We also say that uh, we might lose uh, maybe foreign direct investment. We impose, I mean, we import these resources to our internal system. Then, do you think, or is there a way in which uh, tax incentives that will not go against the global minimum tax, but then as East Africans or as countrymen in this region or any other country in this world, can it provide any other tax incentive that uh, will give us an advantage in terms of attracting foreign direct investment? Thank you. Thank you very much for for that you know question, which is which is very interesting. Of course, there are some tax, there are other tax incentives which can be used by you know developing countries, uh, which may not line up full with you know the the the, the global min, the pillar two global minimum tax. So, and first of all, maybe to clarify, developing countries are free to grant tax incentives to foreign investors, so long as they are not members of MNE groups, multinational enterprises that are within the scope of pillar two. And that means that if you know the group global, global income, or global turnover is below 750 million euro, euro, million euro then the, the host country would be free to grant tax incentive to those, you know, to those enterprises, and they would be affected by by the, by pillar two. But where those, you know, entities are within, you know, uh, the, the 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 scope of pillar two, so host countries would consider, for instance, giving them incentives. Let's say, like fifty, like maybe a preferential CIT rate of ten percent or thirteen percent, so that by applying the substance best income exclusion exception then the effective rate you know of the of the of that you know constituent entity in the host country would be still 15 percent and in that case there wouldn't be any top up tax at the level of the ultimate parent entity other types of incentives that need to be considered are these which i would say defer the payment of taxes like accelerated dep depreciation of assets so those kind of incentives are not affected by uh, you know pillar two global minimum tax so i think that's what i can say on that specific question thank you thank you thank you Dudone. um we we have dr leila back with us um i think we can try once again to see if uh, she'll be able to complete her presentation so Dr. Leila, you donate briefly to us through the different rules for, 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 for topping up to ensure that a 15% minimum, minimum tax is achieved. 
Um, so perhaps you can pick up from there and talk to us about the impact of uh, the Pillar 2 proposals on MNEs in East Africa. Okay, so um, I'm a bit conscious that if I start my presentation, I might be blocked by the internet here. So what I intend to do is that uh, if, if you will allow me with permission from the, you know, Mr. Safas, I'd like to record the presentation from start and then share it with you so that you can float it to the participants, because I think it's really important to really understand income inclusion rule, how it applies uh, together with the subject to tax rule the qualified domestic minimum top-up top tax, as well as the UTPR. We need to understand what these rules mean. What do they mean for the multinational corporations in terms of applying them in their context, in terms of determining their tax liability? So I think um, I would I will record the presentation. I will share it, then it's entirely up to you to, you know, to, to share it with the members so that we have a good background on the same. But when I think about the effect of these rules on multinational enterprises, um, I think of it in terms of a four-tiered approach. So the first part, is that the GLOBE proposal. So when I say GLOBE, it's the Global Anti-Base Erosion, which is another word for pillar two. So the GLOBE proposals, they consider the financial accounting income of each constituent entity as the starting point. However, according to pillar two, adjustments must be made for various items, such as, you know, those companies trading uh, on account of stock-based compensation, pensions, and other factors. Now, calculating and tracking these adjustments can be very complex, especially for multinational organizations with multiple entities that operate across different jurisdictions. The example I want to give is of, let's say, East Africa Bureaus Limited. It operates in multiple countries in East Africa, and it has different compensation structures across all of its entities. Now, determining the stock-based compensation adjustment for each constituency of EABL Nairobi in Uganda in Tanzania, considering the rules and accounting standards require a comprehensive analysis, accurate data collection. Now, initially, I had said Kenya is the only East African country that has signed to, signed up to the inclusive framework. The other East African countries have not. So trying to get this data to try to base what the local tax rules and accounting standards are with respect to apply is really going to pose a problem. Now, the second issue is that the GLOBE proposal itself relies on a complex system of deferred taxes to address timing differences in determining constituent entities' results. So the timing differences occur in recognition of income or expenses for tax purposes differs from the recognition in financial statements. The Africa Bureau is limited. It's got various subsidiaries that use different accounting methods. It results in timing differences in recognizing revenue and expenses. So adapting their enterprise resource is um, to comply with the pillar two requirements. The, the third thing that I also wanted to speak about um, was that the implementation of pillar two may require, re or, may require the organizations itself to update their ERP systems and establish new procedures for collecting and managing the necessary information to comply with the new rules. So how are we complying with IIR, UTPR, subject to tax rule, who's bringing in the qualified domestic minimum top, top up tax rate, right? So this again involves capturing data on a country by country basis. How many countries in the East Africa region have already started the implementation of country by country reporting? Question one. So integrating tax adjustments as part of these different constituents where the multinational enterprises subsidiaries are based and trying to generate those accurate reports on the basis of country by country analysis is going to cause a problem. Think about uh, EABL again, right? So the company needs to modify its uh, ERP system to capture and consolidate financial data from each constituent entity in a way that allows for the computation of globe income loss 
or globe income profits, right? So this requires implementing new data collection processes, developing or customizing software modules, and training employees on accurate reporting. How many multinational corporations in East Africa have already started doing this in preparation for Pillar 2 application? If Tanzania, Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi are not members of IF, the of the inclusive framework for pillar two implementation they're probably not bothered kenya is right so what is kenya doing in terms of safaricom equity bank uh, east africa bureau is limited to try and get the erp system to be pegged on you know the pillar two quantification method that are there we also need to think about um, organizations with little or no minimum tax liability. They're going to face challenges in complying with Pillar 2 rules and fulfilling the reporting requirements themselves. The integrate nature of the calculations, the adjustments, and the jurisdiction specific rules will pose a significant administrative burden on the taxpayers. So look at Tanzania. Um, Tanzania has a company, um, I forgot the name of that particular company, but it's Tanzania Breweries Limited. So AB in BEV is one of the largest brewers um, in Europe, and it operates in 15 African jurisdictions with varying tax laws and regulations. Now, despite having minimal tax liability under Pillar 2, the company will need to allocate income and losses appropriately across the 15 jurisdictions. It's got to be able to comply with the reporting obligations and ensure accurate documentation to demonstrate compliance with these new rules. How is that going to be possible when you have four countries in the East Africa region, if they have part of this subsidiary is not reporting on a country by country basis? So even if a company has a minimal tax liability, it must navigate the intricate rules um, and requirements of Pillar 2. This involves understanding itself of the specific provisions of, uh, of each jurisdiction, calculating the appropriate adjustments and ensuring that the reporting is done correctly. The complexity arises from the need to stay updated with the evolving tax regulations, to interpret them accurately and to apply them to the company's operations. So I think in, in East Africa, just in Nairobi, we've got about um, 67 multinational corporations operating um in the whole of in the whole of sorry not the whole of in tanzania we have about 14 multinational corporations that specifically work on the extractive sector in uganda is one and in kenya we have about i think seven or nine multinational enterprises that work specifically on the extractive sector now think about country by country reporting of these multinational corporations that have subsidiaries not only in east africa well, the compliance with Pillar 2 is going to be really difficult because companies will need to in accurate documentation. This supporting evidence of allocation of income is that if Burundi is applying a different method of putting profits and losses than Kenya, and Kenya is applying a different method than cause issues. We know that the OEC has December 2020, they came up with their implementation pack for, for Pillar 2. And in February this year, they came up with guidance uh, for the Pillar 2 global rules um, into implementation. So those countries that are part of the IF framework of the OECD would be, would be applying this administrative guidance, their accounting processes would be streamlined and uniform. Those East African countries, Uganda, Burundi, Rwanda, who are not members of IF, are not going to apply read the administrative guidance given by the by the OECD. So we're already going to see differences in the application of the standards and the reporting measures. We're going to see differences in country by country reporting. East Africa. Um, region is what they would need to do, uh, the, especially the MNEs in East Africa. These countries will need to review and potentially revise their tax planning structures, right, and strategies to align with the new rules. So forget it. Even if you've agreed under a double taxation agreement that your tax is going to be ten percent or thirteen percent, if Pillar Two passes and is implemented, even if you've paid thirteen percent, you will be required to pay the extra two percent. And the question is, where will that two percent go? Will it go to the 
jurisdiction where the parent entity is resident or is it going to go to the jurisdiction where the subsidiary actually made a profit that's going to be a debate between countries that are part of IF and those countries that are not part of IF so the transactions and arrangements that were previously used to minimize tax liabilities and exploit discrepancies in international tax systems they will need to be evaluated to ensure compliance with the minimum tax rate and to avoid potential penalties and even reputational risks and I'm about to finish um, um, in terms of time, I'm not sure, but um, companies that have been operating in jurisdictions with lower tax rates, for example, those that operate in Ireland, very, very low tax rate, Mauritius talk, uh, low tax rate, um, or taking advantage of tax incentives, they may experience a reduction in their competitive advantage. The minimum tax rate and the rules under Pillar 2 they seek to promote fairness and they seek to um, discourage aggressive tax planning. They intend to create a more equitable um, you know, environment for business as well. In terms of tax authorities, they will also need to work together to establish these common rules, guidelines and mechanisms for enforcement. So again, Kenya is part of IF. The other East African countries are not part of IF, but it doesn't stop. East Africa harmonizing their approach to pillar two and domesticating it in the language that they understand. So you, so in as much as Kenya is a member of IF and it's going to follow the OECD administrative guidance, that administrative guidance, even if Tanzania and the rest of the East Africa countries are not part of the IF, they can still domesticate that law so that we at East Africa level establish common rules, guidance and mechanisms for enforcement. And this sort of collaboration will definitely involve sharing information coordinating audits, uh, resolving disputes related to the application of Pillar 2 rules. Think about East Africa Bureaus Limited, the accounting standards applying in Kenya may be different from the accounting standards that applies in Burundi, but when it needs to report on a country by country basis, it has to have a uniform approach. So this means in as much as Burundi is not part of IAF, it has to agree to the standards that have been developed under the administrative guidance so that the country by country reporting is accurate for the application of the minimum 15% um, tax under Pillar 2. So Pillar 2 is to come into effect in 2024 next year, and the undertaxed payments rule is to come into effect, I think, in 2025 going forward. Um, if, if you're able to just Google uh, the, the Pricewater PwC, uh, the website, so PwC has actually come up with the Pillar 2 country tracker online so you can actually just go and click on any country to be able to see the progress uh, with respect to pillar 2 implementation of that specific country and it kind of gives you a very nice analysis of what's happening and what needs to be done so i'm so happy i haven't been disrupted by internet and i think i am done with, with my um, explanation of what was missing in terms of uh, um, pillar 2 so over to you moderator Thank you so much, Dr. Leila. Um, we appreciate uh, the opportunity to hear from, from you. We obviously look forward to receiving the recording of um, the portion of the presentation that we missed out, which we will be sharing with the rest of the participants. Um, uh, Moko, I believe we should open up the, the floor to anybody who has any questions. Anything you'd like to put to Dr. Leila or uh, to Diodone? so that they can, uh, you know, we can benefit from their further clarifications or explanations on any of these issues. Um, if, if, if you would like to you can drop a question in the chat, if, if, you, if you would like to, you could raise your hand and be given an opportunity to comment or to ask a question. Um, maybe I can just, uh, you know, briefly start off. Um, Take the view of both uh, Dr. Leila and Diodone. Dr. Leila briefly talked about uh, the compliance burden that uh, most many MNEs are likely to face in compliance with the P Pillar Two. Um, hand in hand with this, I would think there, there would be significant capacity and compliance burdens on the part of the revenue authorities as well. Um, given that um, given the need to you know review and verify all these reports that are coming from uh, the various MNEs within their jurisdiction um given the data intensive nature of the reporting they are likely to be to be receiving um so i would like to just get your comments on how 
prepared that the revenue authorities are um, to you know to 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 administer taxes in the pillar two world and what that kind of compliance capacity burden will look like. So that's um, a think... that's a very good question. Maybe I could just take a quick peg at it, and then uh, you know my colleague would take it further from there. Um, you've raised a really important thing, right? Capacity, uh, not only capacity in terms of understanding the context specificities of pillar two, but the technical complexities in trying to get these implemented. So data and information management is very crucial. We need to be able to understand. Um, to what extent are our revenue authorities ready in terms of the infrastructure that is needed to be able to now follow multinational enterprises in terms of how they're reporting, the sort of accounting standards that they're applying, the kind of advanced pricing agreements that they've already shared with them to show how they're going to be, you know, calculating their tax liability. Now, first of all, we do not, even under the, the system currently, we do not have... Um, automatic exchange of tax information currently working. It's part of DTA, it's part of OECD uh, discussions that are taking place. We do have exchange of information, but it is not mandatory. So Kenya can request Burundi asking them that, well, we have a subsidiary of EABL working there. Could you share the tax information that they have now filed with the Burundi you know, Revenue Authority? Now that sort of information is needed, but if the systems are manual and they're not digitalized, it creates some sort of complexities in how we're able to get the correct um, accounting, reporting, and compliance methodology that's going to be taking place around that. So capacity in terms of our revenue authorities understanding what is needed to be able to now track and monitor income losses, profits being reported, and at the same time figuring out the broader picture of the m &E, the ultimate parent entity, where is it based? If it's based in a tax haven, which hasn't yet you know, implemented beneficial ownership transparency laws, we're not going to be able to get that accurate information that's going to show us country by country reporting. So. The implementation of Pillar 2 is pegged on a number of other things that need to be done. We need to agree on automatic exchange of information. We need to implement CBCR. We need to implement beneficial ownership. When all this has been implemented, then Pillar 2 becomes easy for us to be able to track. So technical expertise becomes really crucial. We've got to be able to train the tax administration, if they're not already training, to build their capacity to understand this. It's really important to also bring in the aspect of international cooperation and coordination because multiple tax administrations are going to be involved to ensure the effective implementation of Pillar 2. So how are we cooperating? What sort of information are we going to be sharing? What is coordination going to be looking like? Think about the differences in the legal systems, the administrative practices and priorities as well. So it's going to be a huge task in terms of the technical challenges, the capacity challenges going forward. I'll stop there. Over to you. I think maybe what I can add to what Latifa said. So I think Pillar 2 is going to make some of the things we have seen not working work. Because like, for instance, most of the DTA these countries have, they have exchange of information provisions. Number of countries are members or signatories to the OECD mark, mutual uh, uh, convention, uh, mutual assistance and administrative, administrative assistance in tax matters. And these tools need to be used at least for the tax administration to be able to have access to the information they need for them to be able you know to assess you know uh, whether they should be you know how they should be applying you know pillar two rules to 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 the MNEs operating in their in their jurisdictions. Another important challenge which Latifa has highlighted relates to infrastructure. And I think this is, may even be one of the reasons as to why most of the developing low income countries are dragging their feet joining you know, I, I mean, joining the inclusive framework and mainly adopting Pillar 2, because if one was to look at the the type of, the amount of investment that would be required to have the right infrastructure in place that would facilitate, you know, the processing of all, of all this information. So in some instances, you know, for countries which don't even have many in scope payment is, you know, they may, they may find themselves in a situation where they will be spending more than they are, what, what they, are, they, they will be collecting. So I think it's going to be really, difficult and that's why uh, the cost benefit analysis is something that needs to be undertaken by most of these low income countries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tai, and thank you, Dulene, for. Uh, Maybe uh, I can say something. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, mine is going to be more of a comment. <clears throat> First of all, as the Dulene presented, there is no way out. Whether you want to adopt it or not, it will affect you. <laughs> so yes. that, that should be the starting point. So the, the issue of capacity, I think, depends on how the low income countries are going to argue their case. This is an OECD led uh, move, and the OECD, I mean, the low income countries should be the ones to raise the issue of capacity. But I thought the, the convergence of this is that there is a kind of centralized information. And you are saying that these 750 million euro turnover companies are almost all on the stock exchange. So they are not <laughs> going to be hiding information here and there. That's why some, some of the richer countries are sure that this method will work. So I, I, do, I, I don't think that this information is, going, is supposed to be collected in silos, it should be collected centrally because each of the countries will be using these same in-scope countries. So an in-scope company cannot give different information to different countries. So I wouldn't think that that should be so much of a challenge to start with. But even if it was, we should be looking for our own solutions. Uh, say ESC should get the one centralized uh, system of getting to this. We are doing that in customs. We have the same system in customs. And they should be able to go to OECD and say, yeah, we need resources of this amount, which will help us to implement this system. But if you sit back and say we are not in the framework, then you are, you are, you are doing yourself a disservice. And, um, but ultimately, what I want to say is that I would suggest that there are countries which have laid back. As you may realize, the ESC, East African community, is all about Custom. They, we don't have a, a, a voice of uh, income taxes. They are, they are relegated. So there is very little concerted effort we are going to make through the ESC unless we make our own move. So I would propose that Diodone uh, and Delaira write a paper, an initial paper, <laughs> which goes, an article, not, not, don't laugh, an article <laughs> which goes, which goes to, to the African newspaper, which is the regional newspaper, it becomes like a starting point, which is pointing out especially what uh, Raida said, uh, say from the PwC report of the level mm -hmm. of implementation mm -hmm. and the uptake and general understanding of what is coming. So that it comes as an initial paper and you are like telling people this is happening. Very many people don't know about it and don't care. So mm -hmm. that my proposal is that then it comes under the species of uh, South African tax law uh, cluster, so that nobody is going to say this is a, a Rwanda article, this is a Kenya article provoking Kenya or whatever. It comes as uh, an initiative of the ESC. It comes mm -hmm. in a regional paper. It raises some initial uh, questions. Then we can pick the debate from there, see the uptake of it, we provoke the uh, different policymakers. And of course, once you point out, let's say from the PwC report, the level of uptake, then there will be a feedback of those who say, no, you are not up to date, or Uganda this year, the budget mm -hmm. we have uh, done this uh, mutual agreement uh, law, they, they put it in place, <laughs> but that law must come in the background of people knowing what is going on. You can't just say, uh, this, this we, are, we are not interested. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, I think I see a person on the uh, on the web saying, well, "What about the DTS? You know, mm -hmm. Uganda suspended DTS, or the DTS have got very many provisions which have never been applied. No mm -hmm. competent authority has ever done anything. Mm -hmm. no, no mutual exchange of information." So my proposal mm -hmm. ultimately is that Lyra and the then I hope <laughs> you, agree, you write an article, you start provoking the public. That's all my comment. Senior, you have to now give us more work. We're already running away from, from work. <laughs> and you already you have all these things on your fingertips. You are a teacher. <laughs> your dad is a teacher. This is just uh, this okay. is your data yeah. Since Ellie is here, I, I will jump on him to start the process so we can all contribute. <laughs> nice. So that's a, that, that's a really important. No, you're right. You're right. I think it's it's important to have these discussions going forward with the public, so that everybody is engaged on what really, you know, what's going 
fold, pillar two is being implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Zephas. We've lost you, Daktari. But then I... I, I, no, I can, I'm still uh, here, sorry. Yes, uh, maybe I can uh, make a comment and then maybe seek your clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, when you started the uh, uh, discussion, you gave up a few statistics regarding the, how these uh, global minimum tax will benefit all the countries involved. And your, your view is that it will not really benefit the global south economies. That is, if I go too well, because uh, we will take home at something like 10% of whatever will be collected through this tax. And, and, uh, and given that, that this is the position, probably it could explain the reason why only Kenya, the East African countries, is a member of the, the, of the you call it the in, uh, inclus, inclusive framework. So, uh, would, what what is your opinion? What is your opinion? Given that uh, I can speak about Kenya, Kenya is a dualist. And given that this is getting down mm -hmm. for implementation in the local legislative assemblies, is there a, a mechanism in which the local countries now can domesticate these uh, principles or laws in a way that best benefits them, but still allow them to comply to the minimum tax requirement. If so, what uh, then what would be your best view, your economic advisor of a country like Kenya? What would be your best advice to give such a country in terms, in terms of implementing these principles to enable them to maximize on the collection they are going to get from the global minimum tax? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. This I pro the to design the international tax norms rules forward for what internalization should be like as much framework there's no include. African presented. If you look, so, uh, apologies. I think uh, we are we are losing you. I think the internet uh, is doing that thing again. That uh, clear. Judone, would you like to attempt the question as we wait for Dr. Leila to join us again? And unfortunately, when Munyala was speaking, he was breaking. I didn't get it maybe correctly. Maybe if you can quickly the, 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 the state it, and then I can, I, can, I can comment on it. Do you mind just quickly summarizing it? Yes, yes, please do. I'm asking if you could summarize the question for Judone. Oh, okay. Uh, you can hear me now. I think uh, yes, yes. Some of us, some of us who are abroad might be having challenge, internet challenges. So, uh, 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 when Madam uh, Daktari started speaking, she... no, I'm here. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so basically, I was just saying that I'm anti OECD because I don't believe that OECD produces a sort of an inclusive framework <clears throat> for African countries. Um, and I give you a reason for that. ATAF, the African Tax Administration Forum, represents the voices of African people at the OECD. What usually happens is that when, when closed door meetings at OECD take place, they, they draft the reports, they come up with their standards. And then, for example, they're going to send out the report to ATAF at 10 o'clock at night when the meeting 
meeting is scheduled for nine o'clock the next day. So there is not enough time to be able to now deliberate upon IIR, UTPR, STTR, and how it's going to be implemented and the kind of consequences it's going to have on the continent. At the same time, when they were proposing 15% as the minimum tax, eight have said, look, do not propose 15%. 15% is not going to be viable for African nations because our global average in Africa is 27.5%. So let's agree at, for example, maybe even 20%. That discussion was never even had, right? And you had the delegation from Senegal, from Kenya, trying to support that proposal. Not a single um, a session was given for, for that discussion that, you know, should we increase 15% to 20% or should we just leave it at 15%? So it's not really inclusive. And when we're having these rules, these are neo-colonial rules that are being brought back onto the continent to suppress the fiscal space of the African continent so that the imperial powers of the past can continue to generate more profit out of our countries and enrich in themselves. At the same time, we are tasked with the burden of bureaucracy administrative compliance, international coordination in just trying to get the system work for them. The US is not happy with the pillar two proposal. They don't want globe. They want something called guilty, right? They want to tax intangibles. They're being smart about that. Why are we not being smart about it? So I, in my proposals, I always like to front out unilateral measures. So Kenya did a fantastic job when they rejected pillar one and they said, we're not going to wait for you to propose digital taxation. We're going to bring in the digital service tax. But now in Ruto's administration, he wants to kick it out, right? What we need is unilateral approaches to taxing multinational corporations as independent entities existing on our territories. Not that we want to have like them as part of constituted constituent entities so that we are collecting all their data in terms of the tax that they have played collectively at the global level and then determining which portion belongs to Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania. Rather, there is something called formulary apportionment, which is a more powerful way to be able to tax multinational corporations, which would result or translate in more um, taxes for our economies. So I think we need to be very smart in terms of redesigning our tax systems as we go forward. For me, OECD is just crap. I rather we move on to the UNTC and discuss the formation of international tax rules based on a collective representative democratic understanding of tax from all countries in involved. Back to you. Now that clear, Laila. <laughs> As thank you, thank you, senior. You, <laughs> but you didn't point you, out you didn't point out that he who calls who how much have we done with our own tax even if we're rejecting whatever is mm. from OCD? Yeah. What have we done about yeah. it? What are we yeah. doing about it? That's why we need your article. <clears throat> Because you can, <laughs> you can stop your test and throw out the OECD, but you look at the numbers of the digital tax mm -hmm. from Kenya, mm -hmm. the presentation mm -hmm. I had at IBFD last week was that it was only $5 million. I, I think that's pocket change for Facebook. So I don't know. No, whether but, 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 but senior, senior, it was $5 million for six months. It was collected in six months. Now you so, give us two to three so years. We'll be able to collect years. even more. Making 10x to 50 million dollars still is that tax really worth the debate? But he, but when you look at the risk, and right the now, if you look at the debate, from, if you look at the uh 12b in the UN model, mm -hmm. so to mm -hmm. support a global tax, that's the first step mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. a tax based mm -hmm. on profit. So it comes mm -hmm. back to the better thing you're saying, we can't get it, the implementation, because it is also saying you must have mm -hmm. a, a percentage X on global tax, or yes. you then go mm -hmm. to the profit tax, but that profit is also based on the same OECD model. Or mm -hmm. the third option is say, leave us where we are, mm -hmm. we pick what we can. Mm -hmm. So you are saying, if you yeah. pick what you can, yeah. you are on digital taxation, how much are you getting from mm -hmm. Amazon? How much are you getting from Google? Or what can you do if they refuse to pay? Mm -hmm. Those are my questions. You see, go on, go on, Laila. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I think uh, Dr. Ali has. Uh, 
I tell you, I think this load shedding in Southern Africa is really a problem. I'm, I'm coming back home on Friday, so <laughs> we'll have the conversation better. But I think our own tax systems have a lot of weaknesses that need to be strengthened. At the same time, we, we are not the, the continent that produces most of this technology. The companies that produce this technology are seated in the US and certain European countries. So then they have the privilege to be able to dictate the global view what the tax regime should look like. So what happens is that the OECD and the UN will have to respond based on the parent company where it is resident or where the jurisdiction is. And then that country defines the like, for example, the US. The US is not happy with Pillar 2. Majority of the tech companies are resident in the US. So they're proposing, you know, the IP regime for taxation. It's a clever move because that's the country that produces technology. What are we producing? We have the extractive sector. We can start pegging the, 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 the taxation on royalties, the taxation on how we design our corporate income tax um, tax rates for multinational corporations that are coming into our mining sector, we could create a very different tax regime for them and say that we don't want to be part of OECD and UN, we want to be part of an Africa tax model that creates a different regime for taxing multinational corporations. We've got to be look, we've got to look at what our source strengths are to be able to now redesign and reconstruct our tax systems that's that's the way forward in terms of you know new economic thinking as well We've got a long way to go but i think because we're already having these discussions right now it's not going to be too late to start you know pushing for 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 tax reform within this uh, within these perspectives but apparently the tech companies are global based so the global rules will definitely come from the un and the oecd which are going to now protect their fiscal space they're not going to want to open up the fiscal space for african countries because it doesn't work for the liberal market in which these countries are based so again it's 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 heavily political yeah Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Leila, for that important contribution. Um, uh, Moku, I believe we can close the session there unless there are any burning issues that anybody would like to raise. Um, yes, uh, there is a question by Munezero Esther on the chat section. Probably I can read it out for the members of the panelists. Please do. Maybe Udene will deal with it. She says, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I would like to know the rationale behind the double taxation agreement, along with the jurisdiction of the 15% uh, minimum tax. If I had you, if I had it clearly, why, uh, so why would I like to know, why would I like to know the nexus? I think you want to know the nexus between double taxation and the normal minimum. Maybe the donor can, help explain to her before we finish. Yes, thanks, Mr. Mnyala. So I think this is a very relevant question because uh, this 15% global minimum tax seeks to tax, uh, I would say, business profits of constituent entities derived from, you know, source countries, which are, have not yet, you know, which are not distributed. As, as as dividends and of course if one was to follow you know you know the current you know state of let's say article 7 of the most dtas we have in force which states that business profits can only be taxed in a country if that that you know uh, the enterprise running those business profits to have a fixed i mean have a permanent establishment in, in, in that country so then you know one would say that this is really you know uh a contradiction to to article seven of the of of the DTA, but again, when you when one was to look at it from uh, you know a liberal perspective, you would find that article seven restricts the taxation you know rights of the source state. So that means the the country you know from which the income, the business profits are derived. And in this specific case, you know the country that will be uh, taxing, uh, applying uh, the top up tax, you know, under income inclusion rule is going to be specifically the, the, the country where the ultimate parent entity is based. So yes, the, in the same way as controlled foreign corporation rules uh, have been challenged, you know, to be 
a violatory double tax agreement. So it wouldn't be surprising if we were to see the same argument, especially when uh, the two countries, you know, that are part of the DTA are not members of the inclusive framework and do not adopt, uh, and maybe one of them adopt, you know, uh, global minimum tax. Uh, but uh, it can be validly argued that, you know, this 15% global minimum tax does not contradict, I mean, does not conflict with the main Article 7 of, of the DTA because Article 7 is strict taxing rights of the source country. And in this specific case, the top of tax will be applied by the country of residence. But again, uh, dear Dan, to add to your argument, re remember one of the big arguments is that service taxes are not in most of the DTAs and the US itself is not recognizing it. So this global tax, uh, I mean, this pillar two is basically addressing uh, Article 12, basically, because even if you have a business tax uh, in Article 7 of most DTAs, you will not have uh, the Googles of this world having appearing to have anything, because the idea is that those services are not provided in your country. So you, you would get zero in, in that respect. So even if you say this income is earned here, you have no handle because there is no PE and there is no service provided from that jurisdiction. So it's not sourced there. And that's why they say even the main income arising from advertisements in these digital taxes are arising from multiple countries. So all those issues were uh, argued, of course, before the pillars came up. And that's why uh, you uh, need to see the income arising from the rest of the world. No, 100% agree, but I think this issue of you know absence of you know fiscal presence and you know uh this scaling out masses i think that's more relevant with with pillar one which is you know trying to reallocate taxing right to the source jurisdiction even if there is no such you know uh brick and mortar sort of business undertaken by these companies and i think that's why as you likely stated at 12 b of the UN model convention you know is coming as fallback so you know uh uh, this pillar one thing not proceed. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dudane, for your very informed and comprehensive response to Esther. So I, I think I, unless someone has a question, which can already be addressed by that person raising their hands. We beg to close this session at this juncture. And I will uh, thank uh, the panelists, Mr. Sefas, uh, uh, Mr. Dudonet, and Dr. Harris for the very, very uh, informed and comprehensive statements and uh, discussion that you led with us this afternoon. We are indeed grateful for sparing time of your very, very busy schedules. And we will, uh, will for us, we'll keep Pastor in view for us to learn from the fountains of wisdom and knowledge that you, you, you possess. Natuna Shukuru Sama. Thank you and merci beaucoup. Salibo. Asante Sana, thank you so much. Yes, Mr. Begley, maybe you can close with your final, with the final remarks so that we can. No, I'd just up. like to. To, to reiterate my thanks to all of the panelists. It's been a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon, to listen to you, to collect a lot of wisdom. And um, yeah, we are very happy to have you. We would like to have you again and again and again until this rather complex subject becomes, uh, you know, something, something that we can all easily understand and engage in and, you know, engage our governments, revenue authorities, and as well as in our practices um, with the various multinationals affect, affected by Pillar 2 and, you know, other similar international tax matters. So thank you all of you. Uh, it's been a great pleasure and uh, Karibu. Asante. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye.